Kia ora koutou, ko Tiffany Taku Ingoa, he kairuruku taufainga a hau ki Manaki Whenua. Good morning everyone, my name is Tiffany and I am the Events Coordinator at Manaki Whenua Landcare Research. Before I hand over to Hugh, I'm going to run through a couple of technical slides to ensure that your experience with us online today goes as smooth as possible. If you have joined us previously for a webinar session, you can ignore me for the next minute. You will notice you have a control panel at the side of your screen. If at any time this collapses, you can bring it back by simply clicking the orange arrow button. If you are having sound issues and you can see my mouth moving but cannot hear a word I'm saying, please grab the PDF in the handout section and this has instructions to resolve this quickly. The audio panel is where you can control where the sound plays on your computer. Select the drop down arrow and choose your audio output. During the presentation, you may have questions that you want to be covered in our Q&A session. You can do this via the chat panel throughout our session today. You will notice it is pretty small and it will be hard to read other attendees' questions. Select the pop-out icon on this panel and drag the corner out to make it as big as you want. You can also use this feature if you are having technical issues and ask me any questions. Questions asked by the audience show as anonymous and a green colour in the chat panel. However, please note we will use your name in the Q&A session. If I respond to you regarding a question, this will show as read. Now over to Hugh to introduce you to our fifth session for the Biosecurity Bonanza series. Kia ora koutou everybody and thank you Tiffany for that introduction. Hi, I'm uh, Hugh Gawley, I'm one of the old guys and probably the oldest that's actually in the Biocontroller Weeds team. Um, I've been in, uh, working in the field of Biocontroller Weeds for nearly 40 years now. So. My role here is really to facilitate this webinar and to um, run the uh, question and answer session at the end after Claudia has finished her talk. So now um, about Claudia herself, I'd like to introduce Claudia Lang. Claudia is a capability leader here at Lincoln whose research expertise is in molecular ecology. And I'll leave Claudia to get on with her talk. Thank you. Thank you, you, uh, Morena, everybody, and thank you, everyone, for joining this talk today. So we are a group of researchers here at Manaki Fenua, and the names are on the slide here, who are all interested in this topic, and I'm going to present the talk on behalf of all of us. <coughs> Pardon me. So why are we interested in invertebrates? So invertebrates, of course, um, are mainly beneficial, but there are also some that are problematic. And um, especially when it comes to biosecurity, we want to know about the ecology and how, how they work in the environment. So many invertebrates are quite small and they are highly mobile and therefore they are hard to control. And um, here at Manaki Fenua, we work a lot on biological control agents and um, are mainly interested in how we can make them more efficient. But there are also invertebrates that are vectors for plant diseases and for pests. So all these things are quite important to New Zealand's biosecurity. Um, invertebrates are of course very diverse and so are their microbiomes and their interactions with other organisms. Microbes play a huge role in how the invertebrates interact with the environment. They are omnipresent, they deliver essential services to the organisms, and they basically orchestrate the interactions between the organisms. So we need to better understand the role that those microbes play and what the ecological implications are. Microbes include anything from bacteria to archaea, protozoa, fungi, and viruses. And they can be associated in different ways with invertebrates. They can be on the outside or they can be inside the invertebrate um, extracellularly, like in the hemolymph or in salivary glands, in the midgut, or in specialized gastric crypts that some invertebrates have developed to house those microbes. They can also be inside cells, so some invertebrates develop special uh, organs to house their symbionts and they can be bacteriums or bacteriocytes. So we ask ourselves a number of questions. For example, how do invading exotic invertebrates impact native environments through microbes they bring with them? And how can we assess those impacts? 
how can we improve the risk assessment for in introduced species? And can we maybe manipulate microbiomes for our benefit? And for all these questions, we need to know what techniques do we need to apply or to develop? So for this talk, I'm mainly focusing on plant interacting terrestrial insects, just to narrow down the huge topic of invertebrates. And I'm also going to talk mainly about symbionts because pathogens already get a lot of attention due to the negative effects they're causing, but symbionts actually have huge impacts as well. So there are three main topics I want to talk about. Um, first, um, how symbionts are essential to invertebrates, how they affect plant diseases, and what happens when they get replaced. And all that will be in the context of biosecurity. And I will give examples to each of those three. And at the end, I want to talk a bit about the future, future research direction. So symbionts are essential to invertebrates for a number of reasons, but three are quite important. So the first one is a diet. They supplement essential nutrients and they help degrading indigestible plant parts and to overcome plant toxins. And so they therefore determine which plants the host can eat. They're also essential to the fitness of the host by supporting the immune defense functions and protecting the host from parasites or env environmental stressors. So they determine which environments the host can live in. And they're essential to communication because they produce pheromones and produce volatiles that, that attract the host to the food plants. So they are essential to know to, for the invertebrate to find food and mates. And actually, um, without the symbionts, it has shown in numerous cases that those hosts show a high mortality, a reduced growth and sterility or slow development. So certainly the hosts are certainly dependent on their symbionts. So here's an example on how a symbiont determines the diet of the host. This is the glassy winged sharpshooter. It is a pest and a pathogen vector in North America, and its ancestors were phloem feeders. So phloem is the sap from the plant that comes from the photosynthesis uh, in, the, in the leaves and distributes the nutrients throughout the plants. It contains a lot of sugars, but also vitamins, hormones, but is very low in amino acids. So the ancestors of this um, sharpshooter had two symbionts. The primary symbiont um, supplied eight essential amino acids to the host, and this was retained for now 280 million years, so it's a very stable relationship. And the ancient secondary symbiont supplied the remaining two essential amino acids. In sharpshooters, um, or during the evolution towards the sharpshooters, about 40 million years ago, the secondary symbiont was replaced. And the new secondary symbiont um, also supplies those two essential amino acids, but it's also able to supply the host with vitamins, vitamins and cofactors. And that enabled the sharpshooter to change its diet from the phloem to the xylem. And the xylem is very low in, in nutrients. It's basically transporting the water from the soil to the rest of the plant. Um, so it's a very good example to show how a symbiont substitutes nutrients for the host and how it determines the host range and affects the adaptive evolution. The way um, those researchers found out um, those details was by doing phylogenetic analysis of the insect and the symbionts to study those ancestral relationships and of the insect and of the symbiont, and they found that those clades corresponded very well to each other. They also sequenced the whole genomes of the bacteria and annotated the genes to see which amino acids and vitamins they can actually produce. So coming to plant diseases and how symbionts affect those. Um, so pathogens, get moved around by invertebrates from infected to uninfected plants. That's one way of how the disease is spread. But symbionts and pathogens also interact with each other in the microbiome of the host. And those relationships can, for example, be antagonistic or synergistic. Symbionts themselves can also become pathogenic depending on the environment in which they live in, but also because of mutations or if they acquire genes from other organisms through a horizontal gene transfer. And so symbionts can definitely affect the spread of and the development of plant diseases. 
Here's an example of a plant hopper and how it inhibits a plant pathogen. This plant hopper vectors a phytoplasma, which is a bacterium that causes yellow disease in grapevine worldwide. It feeds on the phloem of weeds and occasionally only on grapevine. But the phytoplasma bacteria also lives in the phloem of those weeds and it's therefore transmitted to the grapevine by the plant hopper via its salivary glands. What in this study was found that, uh, is that um, the plant hopper contained a gut symbiont, which is consistently found in the same wheat plants that the plant hopper feeds on. And it is also transmitted to the grapevine by the plant hopper. Interestingly, this symbiont established then an endophytic relationship with a plant then throughout the, throughout the whole plant and it does not cause any phytotoxicity. It actually reduces the disease symptoms of the phytoplasma and um, it inhibits the bacterium. So here are some photos of the experiments. On the top left, you see healthy plants without phytoplasma and below that um, infected plants with phytoplasma. You can see clearly the disease symptoms. On the right here, you see plants that were inoculated with a symbiont and how they show no disease symptoms. And below that, um, those inoculated plants were then infected and again, you don't see disease symptoms. The researchers here were interested to find out what the mode of action was of the symbiont. So they also sequenced the whole genome of the symbiont to identify the mode of action. And they were looking at genes that could, for example, induce the plant's own immune, resistant, immune system or produce growth, uh, sorry, um, increase growth of the plant. But what they actually found was um, five inhibitory genes. So there were five secondary metabolites or antibacterial substances. And when they grew the symbiont in culture, they could use the supernatant and um, inhibit other pathogens growth with that. So it's clearly an inhibitory function here. So symbionts, can get lost and replaced. And um, they are, it's just like with pathogens, they can be transmitted to other invertebrates and plants. So as we just saw in the former example. In fact, they have been acquired, lost and replaced many times independently during evolution. And are therefore a major driving force of ecological adaptation and evolution. There are a number of reasons for that. So one thing is that those symbionts that are in close relationships with their hosts, they actually undergo some genomic decay over time. They lose some of their genes that are not essential for this relationship. And this can get quite extreme to a point where the symbionts are not actually functioning anymore. And then at those stages, they get replaced. And there are some examples, um, for example, a, an aphid that lost symbionts when it moved from the native to the invasive range. Also, sometimes new ecological traits need to be acquired. So it's helpful to acquire new symbionts or to replace them, or the host needs to adapt to different resources. Um, so here's an example of a symbiont replacement and how that changes the pest status. These are two stink bugs that are found in Japan. And um, they are morphologically slightly different but genetically very similar. So even though they are different species, they only have very small genetic differences. On the left side is the non-pest species. It's a little bit lighter in color and a bit smaller. And on the right side is a pest species. Both bugs are phloem feeders and they perform very well on wild legumes, which are the original host plants. But the pest stink bug also performs very well on crop legumes such as soybeans and is therefore the pest in Japan. While the non-pest bug shows a low egg hatch rate and a high nymph mortality on soil. Both bugs have a symbiont of the same species and um, those they are the same species, however, they are different genotypes, so they have slight genetic differences. Those symbionts are transmitted from the, the mother to the offspring via protein capsules that are laid alongside the eggs. And then when the nymphs hatch, they probe those capsules and get inoculated with those symbionts. So this is a really neat system to study 
symbionts because what has been done was to sterilize those uh, protein capsules to kill the symbionts. And this offspring then showed really retarded growth and high mortality, showing that the symbionts are needed. Um, what the researchers here did was to switch those protein capsules between those two species. And they found that the performance of those stink bugs completely reversed. So the pest stink bugs now show shows a low egg hatch rate and a high nymph mortality on soy, while the non-pest stink bug improved to normal rates like you would look, usually see on the wild legumes. So basically the pest status of this stink bug is principally principally determined by the symbiont genotype rather than by the insect genotype. And only a few genetic differences were enough to cause that pest status. So this example shows um, how symbionts affect the adaptation to nutritional resources and how they can change the plant specialization and the host range. So in summary, I hope I could convince you that symbionts play important roles in ecology and evolution and are therefore quite important to biosecurity. So if we want to protect our native environments from the negative impacts of associated microbes and make use of the beneficial effects of associated microbes and also improve the risk assessment of intentionally or unintentionally introduced organisms, we need to go beyond identification of microbes. So next generation sequencing has been great to study microbiome compositions, but what we need to do now is do a functional analysis. And the way to approach it and what is recommended by the literature is to combine things like phylogenetics and genome sequencing with population genetics. In this way, we can identify novel symbionts in the population and to see what is happening right now rather than go back millions of years. And um, we need to analyze the metabolic capabilities of hosts and symbionts so we can compare that to the plant nutrient profiles and identify the nutrient networks, like who can eat what. And we also need to do comparative experiments on invertebrates that are associated with different microbes so that we can do a functional characterization of those symbiotic relationships. And some of the potential outcomes could be that maybe we can replace symbionts to change the pest status of an invader. Maybe we can selectively inhibit symbionts or pathogens by interrupting their metabolism. Or we can use symbionts as biological control agents of pathogens or pests. And maybe we can introduce symbionts to improve the invertebrate biocontrol agents that we are using now. So I just got a couple of image attributions here in the references. And thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you very much, Claudia. Just very good. Um, we don't have any questions that have come in quite yet, so please, uh, anyone has any questions about such things, um, please write them in and I will ask Claudia those questions. Um, one that I wanted to ask myself, Claudia, was um, have we found any symbionts in our biocontrol agents that we've released in New Zealand so far? Um, I would say that we probably haven't really looked for that because there we mainly look at pathogens. So before biocontrol agents are released, they go through quite a thorough cleaning where they get raised in the or grown in the um, containment to remove any possible pathogens. But um, it could potentially be that we also remove symbionts that are actually essential. So I know of a number of biocontrol agents that are not performing well when they get released and it's not quite clear why that is. So it could well be that they just don't have the right symbionts with them anymore. Cool, okay, thank you. Um, Claudia, we do have a couple of questions. One's um, Elodie Erlacher um, has asked, do we know the effects of pesticides on symbionts? Um, I can't tell you straight away from the top of my head, but um, there are studies where they look at that. Yes, yeah, so chemical interference and how that affects the symbionts and the microbiome in general. So 
yes, I would say there are definitely effects, but I can't tell you straight away like which ones. I don't have an example in my head right now. <laughs> but um, cool. so those references that I gave, they're actually really good to look into if you're interested in that topic. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, another question here from Sarah Jackman. The symbionts in Cassida rubiginosa, which is the green thistle beetle that Manaki Whenua um, introduced into New, New Zealand back in the early 2000s, I think it was, we worked on that. Um, so the symbionts in Cassida rubiginosa have been studied a little bit over here at Ag Research. Um, that's more like a statement, I thought that was a question. Um, do you know much about those symbionts? Have we worked on those here or has that been Ag Research's work? No, we haven't worked on those uh, symbionts or I haven't worked with those beetles. I've worked with the thistles though. So I would be really interested in that, Sarah, if you want to share some of that with me, that would be great. Cool, I'll leave Sarah to get in contact with you about that. Um, another question from uh, Mikhail Falcon. Fungal insect pathogens are well known, but are there many fungal symbionts known from insects? Um, there are some, yes. So one, I'm just thinking of an example that I read just recently was about a yeast. And I can't remember what the host was, but it was a yeast symbiont which um, uh, was transmitted to the grapes that the insect fed on and then produced some metabolites by uh, from this this grape juice which then attracted the insect back to the grapes to feed on them so yes there are certainly examples how uh, fungi also have positive symbiotic effects Excellent, thank you. Um, another question from uh, Rob Simons in uh, Marlborough. Are there any case studies where symbionts have been used in biocontrol? Yes, uh, definitely. <laughs> I mean, um, lots, of, lots of endophytes um, are used in plant biological control. Um, sure. Uh, yeah. There are certainly some that are also transmitted by invertebrates. Yeah. Yes, there's quite a story about endophytes, and you know, endophytes was something that was discovered in New Zealand relatively early on and has been used quite a bit. Right, another question, uh, Shandan Pal. How often symbionts? gut associated pathogens or plant pathogens carried in the gut can be transmitted horizontally? How often is a good question. Um, <laughs> it is pretty much I wonder impossible. How, and how stay. easily perhaps. Yeah, so there are case studies and I think the problem is that um, there there needs to be some more research on that so you can actually make a statement like how often because often um, we only look at a specific pathogen but we don't look at a symbiont because it doesn't cause a problem but then if we would look more into it and study more different systems we may actually come across many more cases where it is a symbiont in the insect and then it turns out to actually be a pathogen in the plant so it kind of highlights what I was trying to get across with this talk as well, that we need a lot more research into that area and also look at systems that don't seem problematic now, but just to understand how this ecology works. Sure. Yep, I agree. It's certainly one of those things in terms of cleaning our insects up before we release them in terms of biocontrol. Sometimes we end up, as you suggested, getting rid of things that might actually be beneficial from our insects and limit their ability to establish or to outbreak in our environment and act as effective biocontrol agents. Cool. All right, another question here from Maria Ayala. How, how, how you already identify microbes that result, oh dear, sorry. Um, 
have you already identified any microbes that result um, in benefits from native trees? She's thinking of a, I'm thinking in a microscopic war against plant pathogens. Um, no, I personally haven't. Um, that's, yeah, certainly an interesting topic in terms of natives. Um, if there are ways in that we can combat those pathogens by using some symbionts and maybe some that we can find in the environment in New Zealand so we don't even have to introduce um, exotic organisms, that which would be an ideal solution, yes. All right. <clears throat> well, I think that's about it for our um, questions. I haven't seen any more come up. Oh, someone's just raced in there. Oh, two, two people have just raced in there with questions. So we still have a bit of time. Um, Peter Buchanan, um, does the EPA now require consideration of the importance or danger of naturally occurring symbionts in biocontrol agent importation decisions? Um, I think you may be better to answer that question. From what I know, um, they only care about pathogens and what has been already identified as a pathogen. But you correct me if I'm wrong with that. I'm probably not the best expert to answer that question at the moment either, because I don't have as much to do with that EPA process as I used to. But the EPA is... Uh, concerned not necessarily even about the risk of associated organisms. That's something more that the Ministry of Primary Industries is concerned about when we release biocontrol agents into the environment. The EPA is more around the impact of a new um, invertebrate, in our case, um, into our environment or a new pathogen if it's specifically for a biocontrol um, or as a biocontrol agent. So. Um, at the moment, I would probably say the case for that is no, but we really would want someone like Clark Ellers from EPA to give us an answer to something like that. Um, next question from Tara Murray. If symbionts are in the gut, what internal physiological route do they take to get passed from one invertebrate to another? So if they are in the gut, they often get excreted with a press. And then um, like the, the insect may poop of a leaf and then another comes along and feeds on that leaf and then takes it up and moves it along to another plant. So it's the most common way. Yeah. Okay. Yes, but then um, there are also ways where, uh, for example, the offspring gets inoculated, like this example with the stink bugs I was giving, where it's um, transmitted from the mother to the offspring in a vertical way. Right. Oh, I was sorry. I appear to have mixed up that last question. <laughs> so that was actually Shandon's question. Um, Tara's question, I probably should put my glasses on. Um, Tara has asked, has any work been done on native insect symbionts and how might they might influence their survival? Example, some of our threatened species. Yes, I just answered that with a straight yes. Um, so. <laughs> Even though I can't really give you a, an example right now, um, I know that a number of people are working on that, especially in Manaki Fenua as well, and some in our group that I mentioned in the beginning. So um, I personally haven't worked with in, in, uh, native invertebrates so far. That's why I'm interested to get into this topic and learn more about it. So maybe if you're interested, you could um, send me an email and I can forward that to the right people. Cool. Thank you. Um, I have to say, um, it's kind of interesting doing this on a, on a webinar type scale, but um, I know uh, Tiffany said at the beginning that your name would be read out when um, 
I asked the question, but there's some really interesting names and I'm probably making a terrible job of actually pronouncing people's names. However, um, I have another question from Disna Guna Wardena. Um, it's a very interesting talk, thank you. My question, how can you introduce symbionts to an insect if we are to use these as a biological control agent? And how can you get these specific symbiont to insects from the natural environment? Yep, so there are a number of ways they can be introduced to the insect. So either by um, letting them feed on the, on the uh, symbiont, or they can even be injected. Um, how we get them from the native environment? Well, if they are cultural bill, we can isolate them from the native uh, environment and grow them in the lab and then apply them. If they are not cultural bill, it's a bit more difficult because you actually have to find the organism that they live in and um, yeah, try to do the transmission in the lab. Um, yeah, but it is definitely possible. All right, thank you very much. Um, so that will be the last question. I would like to make um, a statement. We've had one of our EPA experts um, write in um, after Peter Buchanan's question about the EPA and its consideration of symbionts. Quint um, is involved intimately in uh, EPA applications. So um, his response has been that associated organisms are considered in EPA applications. The decision to release an organism with known inseparable organisms depends on the balance of risk, cost, and benefit. So, um, and apparently the example is a rundo wasp. So yeah, so um, if we know that there are inseparable, separable organisms, it will depend on what risk they might pose to the New Zealand environment or to other in insects. Um, with our biocontrol agents. All right, I think that's about it. Um, thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, thank you to everybody uh, attending and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. I think that's about it. Thank you.